Ignatius Kangave Musazi is a national hero buried at the Kololo Independence Grounds, where every year anniversary celebrations are held to mark Uganda's independence. Uganda is free and independent. Midnight, Uganda is born again in Kololo Stadium. The black, gold, and red flag of the new young state, free and independent. He lies here in recognition of his nationwide struggles for self determination and freedom of the people of Uganda. Struggles he waged starting out as a lone ranger against the political, social, economic injustices meted out by the British colonial masters. British colonialism started in 1891 when Frederick Lugard arrived in Uganda to put in place the imperial resolutions of the Western powers drawn out at the Berlin Conference of 1884. That conference apportioned countries beyond Europe and its dominions as territories for the great powers of Europe. Germany, Great Britain, France, Belgium and the Netherlands. Uganda and East Africa was given to Great Britain. By deception and coercion, Lugard made Kabaka Mwanga sign a treaty that put the kingdom under British protection. This protection was a vague euphemism for British overlordship over Mwanga and his people. The Trojan host for what Mwanga later termed the eating of his country by the white man. The intransigent Mwanga and his equally insolent northwestern ruler of Bunyoro, Omukama Kabalega, were soon deposed, hunted around the African countryside as they put up an armed resistance, captured and exiled to the remote Indian Ocean islands of Seychelles to die hundreds of miles away from home and the people. The British, after deposing the leaders, now turned to and began a process of economic exploitation based on social engineering that alienated the natives from each other and encouraged racial discrimination. British political overlordship made sure the African was at the bottom of this social and economic new order by making sure the African had no part in the political decisions that were made at London's Westminster the center of British colonial power. The natives naturally protested, and when their protest exploded, Musazi, a son of one of Mwanga's chiefs, was among them. The British colonial authorities labeled him one of the leaders of this protest movement, termed the Batakabu movement, hunted him down, sentencing him and imprisoning him. This began a chronology of prison terms carried out against him that peaked to 37 times. What was the nature of this injustice that Musazi perpetually protested against? Socioeconomically, many conditions were lacking. Schools were lacking, clinics were lacking, other infrastructure was lacking. But the peasant was in a dynamic situation. So there was a lot of discrimination. Africans could not stay in town. 
could not own businesses. Our Indian brothers and sisters became prosperous between 1900 to 1962. They had a monopoly or on business. That's a long time. And they were the only ones who were allowed to be middlemen and process cash crops. They were the only ones allowed to operate businesses in the central business districts of urban areas. They were the only ones until the 50s who could access banking facilities. And then the blacks were a captive market. Laws like being idle and disordered were entirely made for black people. No Indians or white people were ever, were ever arrested for being idle and disordered. What does that mean? That you must only go to town if you're going to work for an Indian. But the, the, the logic of that law is to deny Africans access to the urban areas. That's the logic of that. It's a colonial. It's like the Chipande or the past laws in South Africa. Dr. Simba of Makere University has biographed Musazi. He traces his origins to Bulemezi Nakaseke Luero, a political and military frontier in all Uganda's history. The natives had named the place Bulemezi for its social and political turbulence, a situation which has repeated itself time and time. His parents were from Bulemezi, uh, but uh, he was born in Kawempe in 1905. His father was a chief, was a sub-county chief in Nakaseke, Nakaseke sub-county. Interestingly, Musazi did not set out as a Robin Hood. He went to King's College Budo, that school in Uganda which the British set up to educate the African equivalent of its British gentry on their model of their Eton. He then proceeded to the prestigious Church of England's St. Augustine College in London to learn to become an Anglican priest. He was taken by his father to England to study, to become a priest. But then the priest did not want himself to be ordained in England. They asked him to come back and be ordained in Uganda, and he refused, and he abandoned the uh, Christian. When he came back home, things started going wrong between him and his British minders. He found himself that being a priest would not help. And that is the also the time when awakening of nationalism was coming up in different countries of Africa. He went into teaching where he was received warmly by his alma mater. But then it was bang again as he and a number of colleagues, themselves alumni of King's College Budo, protested the injustices of an education system that pegged privileges and emoluments according to race. They decided to demand that for terms with Europeans. And since the headmaster did not listen to them, a big group of uh, Africans resigned from King's College and went and started to upgrade the school. Uh, in 1900, Musazi later became an inspector of schools, an opportunity that enabled him to become familiar with the country 
and also placed him in a position to assess the shortcomings of the colonial education service sector. Musazi falls out of the colonial civil service not only for questioning its value and virtues, but for questioning the unfair privileges and facilitation of its African service officers compared to the British colonial officer. He told Chirunda Chivejija about an incident that sharply focused this public service apathy. He survived a leopard, which when as he was passing with his motorcycle, jumped and hoped it would get on his head. But unfortunately for, the, for it, he had just passed it. And uh, when he looked, he said, he drove completely at high speed and went to his master in the Ministry of Education. And he says, hello, I have survived. But he, I, I'm, let me suggest one thing. As you are staying here, and for me, I'm the one going out. You, let me take your car. Because it will save me from the hazards. He said, hello. Eh? Don't you know that you are an African? You are not entitled to have a car. Is this the situation? So he also abandoned his job. He now launched himself into dedicated civil, economic and political rights activism for the African. In 1938, together with James Chivu, he formed the first trade union in Uganda, the Uganda Motor Drivers Association. Sons had no bus. But he said, no, our people, the Suleiman Serwangas and this bus Chiloro of Karasa, they, they should be allowed to also operate in lucrative busing routes. This was transformed into the Amalgamated Transport and General Workers Union, which in 1974 became Transocean Uganda. This one has endured the test of time, transporting Uganda's goods to and from the coast of Mombasa. He turned to cotton and coffee, two cash crops that the British protectorate government considered the backbone of the country's economy. At the same time, the natives relied on these two crops to earn an income critical to their survival and development in a modern economy. The colonial government's policy on the processing and trading of these crops was slanted unfavorably against the African growers. The farmers were being exploited. They used to grow, but they were underpaid. And all the benefits were being gained by the middlemen, who are Indians. Wherever our coffee flowered, my father knew that it would take 12 months to the cropping. So he would go to the Indian and get money. He would use his crop as a security. And then the, this wind will come at night. So we would use uh, turn over lights at night to, to read the what? The scale. The original person like my father and other could not de detect the cheating method. They were doing it still still silly. He formed the Uganda African Farmers Union, a formal focal unit of opposition to the control of the marketing of cotton and coffee, 
which later became the Federation of Partnerships of Uganda African Farmers. Which African alone would get money to set up a ginery? You had to bring resources together. So it made a lot of logic that for Africans to emancipate themselves, they had to come together, bring all their resources together. Influenced by the ideas of prominent African activists for self-determination, he dedicated to organize formally, politically. In the whole of Africa, the wind of change was blowing. And everywhere people in Africa, they were organizing to get independence. Cohen decides to respond to that. So he introduces reforms that allowed for the creation of political parties. In his conversation with Fena Brukwe, Brukwe made it clear there is no way his people, that's the Ugandan people, would get all their demands outside political independence. The real motive of imperialism, the real motive was to extract from those peoples the foodstuffs, the raw materials we needed, leaving them with imbalanced economies now and aggravating the poverty which was already there. The idea that any one people should assume the right to determine the pattern of life of another people. So he told him it was good to organize the farmers, but it was also nice to organize a political movement which would struggle for independence. To articulate his now clearly political agenda and organize Africans countrywide, he formed Uganda's first modern national political party, the Uganda National Congress. He said, when I organize just to educate the people that we are being exploited, I'm arrested. When I organize them in trade union, I am arrested and a paper short. When I said we have a right to process and also sell our, 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 our proceeds to Britain, I'm arrested. So I think the strategy now should be to organize Uganda so that we get the British out. He calls all nationalists from all over Uganda announces now we have we are going to form the Uganda National Congress. The aims of, of, of the UNC is independence. When? Now. And uh, he formed his, his, his executive. That Uganda National Congress was highly inspired by the African National Congress in South Africa, which is a much older party, formed in 1912, and the Indian Congress, and the Indian National Congress of the Nehru's and Gandhi's. That's why the Musazi is called this Congress. Uh, when you look at the structure of UNC, uh, his organization, his party was a party for all Ugandans. In 1952, at the young age of 15, I joined the Uganda National Congress and, and started the branch of the Uganda National Congress at King's College. A number of students and larger students from formerly from Hudo he had the support. Sections of uh, university students. The UNC started an office in Cairo. 
the U.N. is led by Karekezi, John Karekezi, the father of Kareka Yuhura. And that office organized foreign funds. Apart from Uganda, elsewhere the leadership of the Farmers Association was more or less the leadership of Uganda National Congress. It was his people who were among the farmers organization who became members of the of the UDNs. Musazi laid the foundation for the modern political structures and ideas that were to influence, beget and mentor the country's future leaders, many of whom owe him the honor of a founder mentor. And we talked all night. And he's the one who actually decided for me, says that I should be out. Because Museveni is already in the bush. He needs somebody to be able to expand his cause outside. So you go. I was among the, the founders of UPM, the Under Patriotic Movement. During the National Conservative Council period and up to the elections of December 1980, and what followed, that UPM definitely was defeated because we had a new party. Museven, whom we had chosen as our le as the leader, said, if the, if the elections are rigged, I'm going to go to Bush. Government, when they started to arrest people who had being in Museveni's party, Museveni is going to the bush to fight the government. I had no idea at all that he had, Museveni had really gone to the bush. So on the 12th of February, 1981, I was at home, Nakasero, Nakasero Road, and I was arrested. Now, Masai went to the Shivela and announced that Roda Kalima had been arrested. He was the first person to make even my family know. Even the Mary Clopas and we had other friends in England. Bishop Brown reacted very quickly. Even in fact, Bishop Brown wrote to Obote about me. It was Musazi who went there. He had come to see me and he was him. When he was told, he immediately went. As the country celebrates 57 years of independence, Musazi lies at the country's gazetted hero's place of eternal rest. There is general consensus that the man's legacy will forever survive him in Uganda and the African continent. Power, real power, is with people. And, and as long as Musazi was with the people, he was powerful. He started the cooperative in a small way, but he became the dominant for economic force. And the cooperative union were formed after him. All the others followed him because they said independence is his power. All the other parties came to get power. But Musazi had made people aware that power can only be obtained by organizing the people. It's unfair for, for people like Musazi James Miti, Simakula Mdumba, as you have mentioned, and many others of that category, who struggled for our independence. To be forgotten. After independence, when UPC came to power, you, you remember UPC came from UNC, you, Musazi was forgotten. After all that struggle, agitation for independence, struggling, he was sidelined by UPC and he was still alive. The, the heroism came uh, late after he had died, uh, but even though, okay, he was buried at the Heroes Cemetery at Kororo, like uh, other people, but there isn't, there isn't enough Maybe Thursday, like a Kenyatta's day, 
on Yerere Day in Tanzania, you know, because um, there was there was something tangible that um, Saz put on the political uh, plate uh, for independence. I don't know whether Saz ever thought of making money, but he did not die with property. This house where he was, a house which he managed to, to buy and live happily in Etinda, as a small house. For Musazi, for him to live, was Uganda to be happy, to be peaceful, and all Ugandans to be comfortable, to gain what they deserve. He's the only Ugandan who would attend all our independence celebrations and major functions in a suit made out of the Ugandan flag. <laughs>